service, and uh, we're going to find ourselves uh, looking, uh, first of all, um, again, at uh, these core values that we've been exploring. Um, we find ourselves November 19th at, at Witness, and you can see also in our bulletin, you can see these uh, core values spelled out. We find ourselves on the ninth one, lost people matter to God and to us. And uh, as we explore this today, we'll start by looking at uh, Mark chapter 1. Uh, in Mark chapter 1, we'll, uh, we'll look there as well as um, John chapter 21 in just a moment. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to, to Mark chapter 1. And before we read those verses in Mark 1, uh, let's join our hearts together in prayer. God, we do trust that uh, you are the one that is building your kingdom here. And that we do trust also uh, that um, as you build it, you are working in and through us, your church. In and through us as individuals. We pray again that your word would um, both challenge and encourage us, assure us, comfort us, and push us in the right direction, both as a church and as individuals. We thank you and we praise you for your word in Jesus Christ. Amen. So Mark 1, beginning at verse 14, the section that the NIV calls the calling of the first disciples. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of people. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And then forward to, to John's gospel, John chapter 21. This after the resurrection, and Jesus has already appeared a couple of times to the disciples. And so we get to John 21, verse, uh, verse 1. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire on, of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. Uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Aldrich used to say that evangelism is like strong horseradish. People praise it with tears in their eyes. Now, there's a lot of other word associations one could make with that word evangelism. Um, if you mention it, uh, some people uh, think of, 
you know, evangelical, maybe kind of mugging missions, right? Where you kind of go into a phone booth and you come out with a big red S on your chest and then you charge into the neighborhood, uh, seldom on your own, to win people, to win the neighborhood for Christ. For others, uh, you know, the word evangelism kind of brings up kind of a more of an evangelical ambush kind of motif where we, we lure kind of honest, unsuspecting victims to some type of an event, and then we, then we lock the doors, and then we sing maybe 22 verses of Just As I Am. Some people think of uh, evangelism, and they think about it as some kind of maybe bombing mission from 30,000 feet, um, uh, from this kind of protective cloud cover, uh, in which we just kind of drop these bombs, these backyard bombs of, of gospel bombs onto people's lives. And then still others, that the image of evangelism is kind of herding fish into kind of the stained glass aquarium, right? Where the big fisherman th keeps throwing the lure from the, from the pulpit. I mean, that word evangelism, it's got some freight to it, right? And a lot of Christians hear it, and we kind of squirm a little for various reasons, even in our own seats. Uh, because there's a lot of feelings that is, are associated with it. Uh, some of us, we, we have a lot of deep pain as we think about loved ones who don't seem to be responding to the gospel. Others feel frustration uh, because we can recall all these failed strategies and bungled attempts uh, and mixed motives of the church. Others of us just kind of have confusion over this kind of general task that's before us or overwhelm at, overwhelmed at what we've left undone, right? All these, all these feelings... Um, and God invites us, I think, even to pay attention to those feelings, right, before we kind of dig in our heels uh, to, to even let Jesus ask us some hard questions this morning like, friends, haven't you any fish? In, in Mark 1, Jesus comes along and he says to some potential disciples, come, follow me. Right? That's the call to discipleship, we, we sometimes say. And it's really Jesus' call to everyone, right? Will you come and follow me? Right? We sing that song even sometimes. Right? It demands a response. It demands a commitment. Right? And many here have made a commitment to Jesus Christ, right? to, to follow him with our life, uh, to let Jesus lead us. When somebody publicly professes their faith, when somebody is, is baptized as an adult around here, um, they have to answer some questions, right? And one of those questions, um, you know, from the form of public profession of faith, ends with, and do you with repentance and joy embrace him, that is Jesus, as Lord of your life? And many of you have responded at some point or other in your life by saying, I do, God helping me. Right? And, and if you haven't been baptized, if you haven't made public profession of your faith and you're interested in thinking about this or, or what this means, you're welcome to talk to me or any of the elders or deacons. Uh, the point is that Jesus says, come and follow me. And, and many of us, in many, of, many ways, have done so. We've said, I do. We've said, in effect, with repentance and joy, Jesus, I will follow you. You are the Lord of my life. Here's this, the other shoe dropping the kind of part, right? You can see where we're going here, right? Because Jesus doesn't just say, come follow me, right? Um, in, in, your, in your bulletins, uh, there's a little letter, I think on pages uh, 5, and it kind of goes on to page 6, a little letter from Rick Adma. So if the sermon gets boring, feel free to, to read that while, while I'm talking. Um, I'll consider it a spirit-inspired moment for you, um, uh, Rick Abma, who was here in uh, September, refers in that little letter to um, an illustration by Reggie McNeil. McNeil uh, points out how the church is kind of like an airport terminal, right? Airport terminals are themselves, in and of themselves, not destinations, right? No one stays at an airport overnight if they can help it, right? The seats are hard. The lights don't go off. The public service announcements just keep going on and on and on, uh, on repeat. And the reason why, why, right, airports were not designed as destinations. They're not vacation destinations. They, they connect us to a destination. And in a parallel way, not the exact same way, but in a parallel way, a church is not designed to simply be the destination of what God puts his blessing into, right? But to connect God's blessing to the rest of the world. And so following Jesus, Jesus says, come follow me. Following Jesus means following him somewhere. 
Right? Jesus, says, Jesus does not say, come follow me and I'll give you an easy chair. Come follow me and, and, and I'll make your life comfortable. That's not what he says. He says, with Jesus, it's always, come follow me into my dying and rising. Come follow me into a pattern of sacrificial love for others. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Right? Jesus said, says to everybody who would come follow him, I will make you fishers of people. Women, children, I'll make you fishers from, from China Bar to the Nass Valley. I'll make you fishers of red and yellow and black and white. I'll make you fishers of funny people and sad people. I'll make you uh, fishers of people who look like they've got it all together and people whose lives look literally like all hell is breaking loose. I'll make you fishers of your friends and of your enemies. I'll make you fishers of your in-laws, even when they feel like outlaws. I'll make you fishers of the beautiful and the ugly, right? Of, of all sorts of fish. Beautiful, glorious, chrome-colored fish and even nasty bottom feeders. And, and some of that fishing imagery doesn't always even sit so well with us, with me anyways, right? But I know that's a human problem and it's not a God problem, right? Jesus never instructs us to use some sort of kind of bait and switch, right? Lure them in with, with some sort of glitz or pomp or even ritual and then do some sort of switcheroo and, and disappoint them with religion. When Jesus, what Jesus says to the disciples, what he says to his disciples everywhere is, is come follow me. I will rescue you and turn you into the type of people who fish with me for other people. Right? The rescued become rescuers with Christ. Right? And, and somehow, mysteriously even, it's in the following of Jesus that we become fishers. And as followers of Jesus, as disciples, as what we might call apprentices, um, that is what we are. That's our identity. And so if you think about apprentices in general, if you're an apprentice of a musician, if you're an apprentice of, of a professor or a screenwriter, right, these people don't need to think for a second, right? Are you an apprentice, right? They will be able to respond immediately, right? It, it can't escape their attention, right? Yes, of course, I'm an apprentice to so-and-so. The, the same might be or should be maybe more true about those of us who are disciples or apprentices of Jesus. But if I ask or if we're asked whether or not we're good apprentices, you know, most apprentices, you know, might hesitate. They might say no or they might say yes. Right? Asked if they could be better students, um, they would probably say yes. And I think certainly all of us fall into the category of, of being an apprentice, of being a disciple. For, for to be a disciple in any, or, um, in any area or any relationship is to not be perfect. One can be a very raw and incompetent beginner and still be a disciple. Of course, one should not always remain raw and incompetent, both as a disciple of, you know, an apprentice, you know, as a musician, or as an apprentice or disciple of Jesus Christ. But it's, it's kind of part of the refreshing realism of the Gospels that we often find Jesus doing nothing less than kind of bawling out his disciples, right? But, but that's very far from rejecting them, right? It's, in, in fact, a kind of a way of being faithful to them. Just as we see chastisement, God's way of showing that somebody is his child, um, a good master uh, takes his apprentices, takes her apprentices very seriously and therefore you know, takes them to task when needed. So I think it's helpful. I've, I found this definition by, by Dallas Willard very helpful when we're thinking about disciples or apprentices as, as someone who's decided to be with another person under appropriate conditions in order to become capable of doing what that person does or to become what that person is. I think that's helpful here, right? Jesus says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of people. Right? And, and how, just how do the first disciples respond? Well, verse 18 puts it pretty clearly, right? Come follow me, Jesus says, I'll make you fishers, uh, I'll, I'll send you out to fish for people. At once, right? At once they, they left their nets and followed him. Verse 20, without delay. And, and I think it, it provides an opportunity for us to ask ourselves, so what's delaying me? What's delaying you? 
I could stand up here and maybe tell you a, a few fishing stories. Okay, maybe I will. So the picture on the left is a picture of a fish that I caught a few years ago. Um, it's a Chinook. I caught it with uh, Heidi and my brother-in-law John and I. I think you know I could tell the story of you know taking 45 minutes to an hour, each of us taking a turn on the rod. Anyways, I, I by the way I, I found this picture on Facebook. It's somewhere on my Facebook feed, and there's a comment from Jimmy giving me instructions on how to make the fish look larger, right? He's like, Joel, you got it all wrong. you got, you got to have the angle. It's so much more important, right? Anyways, uh, so mention that to Jimmy when you see him next. Um, the picture on the right is a fishing story of my friend uh, Reg and I up uh, in the Nass Valley fishing, I think, last year. Anyways, fishing stories. Um, in the passage that we read from the end of John's Gospel, there's this fishing story about Peter and these other disciples, right? And so the, a few of Jesus' disciples are kind of hanging out together after Jesus' resurrection. And, and Jesus already appeared to them a couple of times in the flesh. They know that he's alive. They, they just don't seem to know what to do about it. So Peter kind of gets the ball rolling. He says, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm going fishing. And the other disciples who seem to be flailing around, you know, they're looking to get their hands dirty too. So they all chime in, well, we'll go with you. Right? And in some ways, isn't this kind of how God works often? He calls us to come and follow him, and then we end up at the exact same place with the same people as, as before he called us. And, and so just like the fishing disciples, everything is the same, but somehow everything is different. I mean, even though, they're, even though they're back to the old routines, nothing is the same. And so as if to emphasize this, they catch absolutely nothing. Right? Skilled fishermen go out in prime time, and they get skunked. I mean, there's another story in this for you somewhere, not about me, but this is true, right? This happens, right? And so, as if to add insult in, to injury, there's this guy on the shore, and he's yelling out to them, Hey friends, haven't you any fish? A and the way that the guy asks the question uh, in the Greek, well, the way it's phrased in the Greek, assumes that the answer is negative, that the answer is no, right? So some nosy guy there on the, on the beach basically shouts out, hey, you guys haven't caught any fish, have you? So, I mean, it doesn't take much to imagine what that would be like to be in your favorite fishing hole on the Zimacord or the Copper, and a busybody comes up and he notices and he yells out, hey, you guys haven't caught any fish, have you? I suspect we can all attest, right, that questions that come in the midst of failure are not usually welcome questions. Hey, why are you so grumpy? Not always a welcome question, right? But they can sometimes be quite revealing questions, opening us up to the opportunity for growth. Friends, haven't you any fish? And, and although the disciples don't yet recognize him, this is a Jesus question. And Jesus' questions are, are usually penetrating and revealing and dissecting. Friends, haven't you any fish? And he, and he asks this question, and I think it's a question of all of his disciples, all of his apprentices. But, but he doesn't leave us there, kind of floundering after the one that got away. He, he instructs, he moves on. And so he tells them, pretty simply, uh, cast your nets, throw your nets on, on the other side of the boat, and you'll find some. Right? Echoes of, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people, right, from Mark's Gospel. And so what do the disciples do? Well, quite simply, they obey. And, and they meet with triumph, right? Overwhelming triumph, really, right? Unprecedented fishing. Somebody apparently counted the fish, 153 fish. And, and scholars have for, for centuries tried to kind of spice up this little story by, by looking for all sorts of symbolism and hin hidden meaning. And so depending on the various commentaries one can read, everything is freighted with secret meaning, right? So the boat, the net, the water, and of course most tantalizing of all is, you know, for people that hunt for secret meaning, it's this, you know, 153 fish. And my favorite little story about this comes from, uh, from no less than Augustine. And according to Dale Bruner, uh, Augustine thought this was a symbolic number, uh, which was arrived at by remembering that there are ten commandments, right? and seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? And of course, 10 plus 7 equals 17. And if you add all the integers from 1 to 17, so 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 all the way to 17, you arrive, of course, precisely at 153. So there you have it, 153 fish, 
a symbol of both law, 10, plus gospel, uh, 7, right? Of course not, right? That's, you know, attempts at, at complexifying the story only ruin it. The point, it seems to be, is that the disciples obey, and God provides these incredible fishing conditions. And it's the obedience of the disciples that's linked somehow to the uh, amazing catch of the fish. When they did, as Jesus instructed, they were, able to haul, they were unable to haul the net in, right? Because of this large number of fish. And, and, and this is a story here in, in John's Gospel, is to encourage us to follow the voice and the instruction of this Jesus of Nazareth. Right? John includes this story uh, that following Jesus makes us fishers. And uh, um, as uh, missiologist Spencer Burke points out, maybe too many Christians are, are too focused on things like target markets and, and strategic plans and statistical research, you know, that part of what it means to do church in the modern world. And, you know, questions like how can we reach this segment of the population and, and how can we be relevant in this part of the culture and how can we get brand recognition in, in a crowded spiritual marketplace? And the answer is almost always a, a new program or a new way or some kind of image overhaul. In many ways, we can dangerously start to function like retailers, right? Branding our goods, kind of fending off the competition, always trying to increase sales. The more success we find, the more success we actually need to kind of keep the thing going. And so we're, we're desperately trying to absorb the right information in the right way so we can master this technique in order to sell the gospel of Jesus Christ. But of course, there's another approach to missions that's pretty biblical. And the other approach, in this approach, Christians see themselves, we see ourselves not as retailers of the gospel, hawking our wares. Instead, we see ourselves as wholesalers of the truth of Jesus Christ. And, and our main desire is to, to help people see the gospel in its pure and raw beauty. There's, there's no shrink wrap, there, there's no free steak knives, there's, there's just Jesus. And so right here in John's gospel, the disciples seem to return to fishing with this renewed passion when they are obedient to the voice of Jesus. You can take a moment to absorb that, uh, that image. It's nice to, to be able to search for all sorts of wonderful images of, of various biblical stories. And, and, and the story from, from John's Gospel, the disciples first don't recognize Jesus. And, and, and it could very well be, you know, I went to the eye doctor this past week, you know, maybe he's too far away, right? Maybe, maybe they just can't, maybe they don't have 20-20 vision, maybe they just can't see because he's far. Or maybe somehow he's intentionally hidden them, uh, hidden uh, himself from their, from their view, from his identity from them. Or, you know, there's a variety, but, but what's important is what the co causes the disciple whom Jesus loved, right? The disciple whom Jesus loved recognizes Jesus. Well, what caused him to recognize Jesus? It's this large number of fish. It's this abundant ca uh, catch. And, and, and so it's, it's really God's overflowing goodness that makes him re uh, um, recognizable. They recognize him in the abundance, right? The steadfast love of the Lord, right? Never ceases. Um, and so Jesus shows himself when these nets are hauled in. It's only then that the disciples announce it is the Lord. It is the Lord. All right? That's what the disciple says. He looks at the fish, and he, and he concludes using the very same language as the Easter morning proclamation in John's Gospel. It is the Lord. Earlier in, in the Gospel, at, at John 15, John, uh, Jesus says to the disciples, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And apparently, he meant what he said, right? Here's this fishing disaster turned miracle and, and, and all in, in this fishing disaster turned miracle, all the disciples learn this lesson firsthand, that Jesus needs to show up before anything's going to happen. Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. The connection between the, between the miraculous catch of fish and the disciples' mission. And, and, and we see the, this in, in, in Peter's action in hauling in the, this net, right? So that, that verb to haul is the same verb that's used to describe those who, who come to Jesus from God, right? Also in John, this is where, where the, the parallel is made, uh, Jesus makes various announcements, right? So he, he says, no one can come to me unless drawn 
hauled in by the Father. Right? Uh, and I, when I lift people from the earth, will haul in, will draw all people to myself. Right? It's the same word here. Right? Uh, so they, they cast the net, and now they were not able to haul it in. They were not able to draw all people in. And conversely, pretty soon they will. Right? The disciples draw in this catch of fish eventually, and it shows that they and we now join our Lord Jesus Christ in drawing people to himself. I mean, what does it mean to be a fisher of people? It means drawing people to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we, we draw people to Jesus, first and foremost, by following Jesus ourselves. And of course that means some simple things like serving and praying. That means explaining God. That means letting ourselves feel the pain of others. That means loving unconditionally. That means encouraging people to turn away from darkness and towards light. That means leading people to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We draw people to Jesus by following Jesus ourselves. The two are inextricably linked. They, they cannot be separated. Come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of people. So Jesus provides this abundant catch of fish, and he invites his disciples to, to draw in the fish that he's provided, but he does, he does one thing more here. Right, Jesus already on the, on the shore, he's got this fire crackling with a breakfast of fish and bread. Jesus, the bread of life here in John's Gospel, right, Jesus nourishes his disciples. And the way the miracle is told mirrors actually a, another miracle. And, and I, I didn't notice it until just now, but one, one of the disciples um, is described as Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee. And so um, it, it's, it's significant that um, as this story is told, um, Jesus' ministry um, at the very beginning started with a first miracle. And that's when he turned water into wine, where? At Cana. Right? And just as Jesus' miracle, as ministry began with this miracle of unprecedented abundance, right? the water turned to wine at Cana, so too the church's ministry begins with this miracle of unprecedented abundance, nets overflowing with fish. Right? There's an intention. John 21 is an assurance story to the church. Right? Jesus is alive. Right? As the disciple notices the miraculous catch of fish, that's what he, it, you know, it's the Lord. A few days later, late, uh, earlier, Jesus had um, appeared to his disciples. He stood among them and he said these words, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And he, and he breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. And is this not what every Christian needs to believe? And is this not what every Christian struggles to believe? And is this not the great confession of the Christian church across the world and across all time and place? Right, That our Savior is still with us and that we are not alone, that we are not abandoned, not working and serving under our own strength. The story is told about Mark Twain, and maybe you've heard it before, but, but he apparently hated to catch fish. Um, Problem was, he wanted to get out fishing to relax, and, and catching fish kind of ruined the relaxation part since he kind of had to take the fish off the, the hook and then he had to do something with the fish. Some of you can maybe relate to this. Uh, so, so what he wanted to do, when he wanted to go out and relax, by doing nothing, people thought he was just being lazy, right? But if he went fishing, he could relax all he wanted. So people would see him sitting by the river bank and they'd say, hey, look, he's fishing, don't bother him. So Mark Twain had kind of the perfect solution. He would, he would take his fishing pole and his line and a bobber, and he, but he wouldn't put a hook at the end, right? So he, he'd cast the bobber and, uh, into the water and he'd lay back on the bank and that way he could relax all that he wanted and he wouldn't be bothered by either humans or fish. And I like the story, but it asks me and maybe you a tough but important question. How are you like Mark Twain? How do you intentionally or unintentionally sabotage your fishing efforts. Sometimes, quite frankly, we'd rather not catch anything, right? I mean, and certainly we've got our own rationale. I mean, what are we going to do with the ones that we catch? I mean, sometimes it's simple laziness on our part, right? I've, I've got no time to invest in relationships. Maybe it's a different excuse, right? You know, I'm untrained or I'm uneducated edu or I'm unrighteous or I'm ungifted or I'm unwilling. 
or or finally we just justify we just justify that you know cleaning fish is this kind of this messy business so maybe it's best just to fish without hooks i think we know though that there's really no legitimate justification right there's there's no loophole big enough to so to, as as we might say there's no loophole big enough to kind of get us off the hook in our core values statement uh one of them says lost people matter to God and to us. And if lost people matter to God and to us, then Jesus, I think, has something to say to us again today. Jesus says the same thing to his disciples. He says the same thing to the church universally. He says the same thing to us, the Terrace Christian Reformed Church. He looks, us, looks at us and he observes, friends, haven't you any fish? But then he doesn't leave us there. Because he also offers reassurance that can only come from the Lord. He says, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of people. I speak these words to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.